<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I think we've got most everybody on here today. Um, I want to thank you all for attending our first developer forum. Uh, my name is Terry Helton. I'm the managing director for the multifamily programs. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items, if you all don't mind, to mute yourselves. Um, and also, if you have any comments or questions, you can put those into the chat for us. Um, there will be some time at the end of the discussion to um, answer those questions, um, and then we will um, make sure everybody has a minute to ask any additional questions that you might have. Um, as you all aware, um, our qualified allocation plan runs on a two-year cycle, and we are now at the end of this current cycle, and we thought this would be a good opportunity to um, look at our policies, look at our scoring, look at our distribution of credits. So earlier this year, we did put out a request for a proposal for consultants to do that with us. Um, through a selection process, we have selected Mark Shelburne with Nova Gratic Company. Um, and you all are, you know, very familiar with him. I'm sure you all know him, you know, through different conferences. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first things that I had asked Mark to do was to meet with our outside partners with the help of Tiffany Marthaler and the Kentucky Housing, <laughs> Housing Coalition. Um, he's met with many of you to um, get your thoughts, get some feedback, and I'm very appreciative of all the comments that we have received. So. <clears throat> with that, we have compiled a list of some of the items that um, seem to be hot topics um, and some of your concerns. So I'm going to kind of break these down into three different categories. So one is some what we want to call quick wins, if you would. Um, and those would be um, for our guidelines coming forward. Um, we've got the notification for application for funding. Um, this is such a wonderful topic for everybody, um, including the staff here at KHC. Um, we are going to be making some changes going forward to this particular form. Um, we will add on this form uh, a place for you to include the email address for that elected official. And you will still need to complete this form. You still will need to make sure all the information is correct. You'll still need to sign it upload it with your application. However, KT will going forward would take care of sending that notification out to those elected officials. You will not, no longer have to do that. So that's um, a positive, I hope, for you all. Um, again, we will be taking care of sending that out. Our errors and omissions, we are going to be reviewing these policies and how we look at errors and how we look at omissions. So. Um, I don't have any definite information for you today, um, but that is something that we are internally reviewing. Our closing deadlines, um, we are looking at offering in our award letter a two-year closing deadline. This would be a hard deadline, and it, by doing so, would remove any type of credit swap or closing extension request off the table. So just, I know there might be some uh, questions or comments about that. If you don't mind, just to throw those into the Q and A, we can answer them at the end if you don't mind. So these are just some of the things that we're working on. Um, our capacity review, um, our capacity review application will be opening up in January for those who have an approval deadline or expiration of 12-31-23. Um, you can go ahead and get that um, capacity application submitted um, in January, and those will get reviewed as quickly as possible. My goal is to have a weekly uh, review period to get those done, and we are looking at a longer review um, approval time. So the next group of items are, to are topics that we're currently discussing as well. Um, document submission timeline, the, um, we have, oh, I may have gone too far, sorry. Here we go. Um, the timelines for our document submission. So we're looking with, uh, working with the group from the coalition to see if we can get these in line with the industry standards um, to see if maybe we could shift some of those documents that we do request, um, shift them around a little bit to what it make a little bit more sense. 
Again, and we're also looking at our cost containment limits internally as well. Um, this is going too fast. So some other items, I apologize, um, that we are, we are going to be looking at. I don't, again, don't have anything definite to present to you all today, but these are things that we are looking at. It is the evidence of site control, the duration of that, um, the taxes and bond timing for board meetings. We are no longer going to be having an open window, per se, for the taxes and bond application. So this may or may not still be a um, concern, uh, but we are still going to be looking at that. <clears throat> the zoning approval submission requirements, design and construction minimum design standards. Again, these are all still um, items that we are going to be looking at internally, and we will get you some updates as soon as um, we can. And so with that, um, our biggest item that we have to talk about will be our scoring criteria. Um, and I will let Mark talk about that. Very good. And you're right, indeed, that was quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the I just want to reiterate that the it, one of the main purposes of today is to hear from y'all. We've got Looks like about 60, give or take, outside folks that have tuned in. And um, I know it's real tempting to think, well, I'll just sit back and hear what everybody else has to say. But that's not the way to think about today. This is your chance to put your ideas out there and let the world hear them and um, and and respond. And that gives your what you have to say a lot more credibility if you're willing to put it out for other folks to hear it, respond to it. So, so I definitely have all kinds of thoughts of my own. I'll share some of them here, but um, again, the main point is to, uh, to get input from, from everyone here that's tuned in. So these are really um, along the lines of conversation starters. So the first here is the notion of how KHC divides up the housing credit resource. And it's uh, everybody knows that the goal of this coming upcoming cycle is to increase supply to have more units on the ground that's that's not any kind of secret or anything that's something that gauge the leadership makes clear all the time and so the most obvious way to make that happen is to shift the percentages from how many go to rehabilitating existing units to how many go to creating new units and so i think that in the first draft, it is not shouldn't be a surprise to hear that that is the plan will be to propose that as a change. The extent to which it shifts is not yet set, just like a lot of other things that Terry was talking about. Um, but um, but that number again, as proposed, as will be proposed in the first draft, uh, is everybody should expect that to go down. My own personal thought would be for it to go down to ten percent, but. Um, but that's just you know where I would what I would do as an opener, leaving ninety percent of the credits to go for creating new housing. And so, then the question becomes: How does KHC divide up the resource? And there's really no right way to do this. the The two general concepts of how to split up the resource are to do it based on some definition of need, or to do it on a per capita basis. And then that those are just, again, the very high level ways to split up the resource. There are many, many others. And, um, and even there are the questions within those. So I, again, just so you get more, I think it's important for folks to lay their biases on the table, despite being a policy person. That's what I do is what I've been doing for 20 years. I tend to think that per capita makes more sense because there's need everywhere. But again, that's just my own personal opinion. But even if you presume per capita, how do you def how do you make the split? How do you make the um, where, which geographic considerations do you take into account? Cities, counties, regions, MSAs, census tracts, um, and, and and those would all be the same questions if you try to come up with some other way to split the resource. And so that's going to be a question for KHC to consider along with you guys when you give your input. And I hope in making this point, 
what I just said gives you a hint of something that I should have opened with at the outset, which is for folks to not just think in the current confines of what has currently been in the QAP and what has been there for however many years. We have the potential here to do something really different. That's one of the reasons why agencies bring me on is to think, well, how can we do things completely differently? And so I would encourage you with both this and the next category of, of scoring to really open your mind to new possibilities for how things can work. So again, that's the, that's the question. And where does the resource go within the state? And so the, those are all opening thoughts for me, but we'll want some more from, from every one of you. So I guess with that, unless someone with Casey has something to add to those rambling thoughts for me, we can move on to the next slide. So there's a multiple scoring considerations to take into account. Uh, there was a lot of feedback from those of y'all with whom I met and then even some through writing about the concerns, frustrations, et cetera, with one or two, maybe more of the KC scoring criteria. So I think there's a lot of openness to coming up with different ones. But even if the presumption within those who make the decision was to keep everything the same, which it isn't. But even if it was, you couldn't with Opportunity 360. That's gone. It's no longer available. So we need something different. So in anticipation of that, KHC very wisely signed up with Policy Map, which hopefully you all saw the email that they sent out on Friday saying to take a look at it. And, um, and I've got it pulled up here on my website. Um, and so maybe later on we can have some fun looking around at that data, what's available, but you can do it yourself too. They've got a lot that's available on their public website. And so having spent some time on it, these are the ones that we, although I guess I should say it's mostly me, I don't want to say the case he's endorsed any of these things that are on the screen here. I mean, they kind of have because they copied and pasted it to the slide, but um, none of these are specific, definite proposals. These are just initial thoughts for what, the QAP could take into consideration from the policy map website in to accomplish some of the same purposes that Opportunity 360 did. And it's not, it, it, no matter what, it won't be as neat and clean. Opportunity, the, the beauty of that site was it pulled all this data together and came up with a number. And that was its real value add, and that's gone. So what we have to do if we, if KHC and you were to use this, is really to take the step back to the data that Opportunity 360 started with and then ourselves come up with the next step of what does that mean in terms of a number. And so these are just some considerations of what are the, the, um, of some things we can take the, to take into account. And the notion with each of these to pick is to try to avoid criteria where the data, the number that's in there is a fixed data point, like uh, er, like the actual income, like say 50% incomes, instead of saying percent, if it were to say like, you know, $40,000. Well, $40,000 in one part of the state is very different than it is in another part of the state. And so the attempt is to have percentages and um, indices. And so you can see there in... Um, the, the first one there is basically an indice, an index that, that there's a there's a definition of persistent property tracks and the idea of census tracks and the idea being that you're not in one. And um, of course, I, I should step back, skip a step here of which geographies to take into account. And um, in our discussions, we've come to the conclusion that census tracts make the most sense. Um, that's but that's not written in stone. There are multiple other various forms of ways to pick uh, definitions, including counties, their block groups, zip codes, et cetera. But census tracts, for a lot of purposes, uh, make the most sense. And so um, you can see the idea of continuing on not being persistent poverty if, for the next one, if you are in a census tract that is higher income than the surrounding area, then that would 
be an incentive that would get that would have a reward of some kind in the QAP, and um, so that's the way this these would work. And then there's the, another slide with um, some more of these criteria that we can take a look at that, just so you can see um, the next group. Yep. So there you go. So the these because they again they have all kinds of data. If you haven't looked at it yet, you really should because um, they have all these different categories. And there's this notion here that where they actually pull together not just transit but road density because obviously you can't have there's a lot of places in Kentucky just like many other states where transit isn't even available but roads are. And so this is the question of where do you have a better shot at getting either transit or getting access to a road. Um, there's a national walkability index, which is different than walk score. Those of you who have been in states that have tried to use walk score, I'm not a fan of that. But the national walkability index is different. Um, and it seems like it could work potentially. Um, there's being closer to jobs. There's um, this next one here is a tough one because it's school districts, though. That wouldn't be census tracts. That's a larger geography. And then the last one here is there's um, a notion of the area of health deprivation issues. And so you can, where you have people that in the lower ranked areas um, would have fewer um, health issues. So I apologize. It's kind of lurked that my internet connection is unstable, even though I'm renting one of those we work kind of places you would think that they would have good internet so hopefully i stay with you um or maybe i'll ask for my money my money back um but um yeah so the, these are all these are all things to consider there are others and these are again these are just in the notion of replacing opportunity 360 there's all manner of other types of things the khc could score um experience um, historic project-based rent assistance money from local governments money from other sources the list is Almost well, it's not quite endless. I pulled together many years ago a list of 114 QAP criteria. So it's about 100 or so possibilities that um, could be in. Most of them don't make any sense, but um, but there are possibilities. So if we can go to the oh, and, and before we move on from this, one other thing is how would you, as the developer, interact with this? Do you go to the map itself, or does KHC pull out the data? look through data tables that's another thing to work out um, presuming that there is some form of, of of policy map type information and so with that i think we can move on to the next slide although we're getting kind of close to the end here um, but this is a big one which is how to address khc's goal of that is now also enshrined in the National Council of State Housing Agencies recommended practices uh, for allocation and underwriting. And, well, Housing Credit Administration of, of that the allocation underwriting portion is to remove barriers to disadvantaged groups. And there have been, there was, uh, there were points, as at least most of you know, in the QAP in the last couple of years, trying to implement that. Um, there was some expression among multiple sources that um, maybe they didn't work as effectively or didn't the implementation of those by all parties wasn't what was the intent. And so if that, to the extent you agree with that and you also agree that, there, that the purpose of these points is still necessary, which I know KHC leadership does, the question is how do we make this happen? How do we implement it to have it be better? And um, Certainly not proposing an answer. We're open open to thoughts and inputs there. And um, and then, as um, as I mentioned, uh, as I've mentioned all along the way, again, what are some other possible scoring criteria? The really don't just limit yourself to the way things have been. You know, like so, we need to change a decimal point here. Or no, you don't need to just think like that. You can think about whole new concepts of scoring. Now, they may not go anywhere, but they certainly won't go anywhere if you don't think of them and suggest them. And so. That then uh, takes us to our last slide, unless, again, there's something else, uh, Terry, that you wanted to add to the various things that I've mentioned there, or maybe even 
correct yeah. to say that. I have, have, <laughs> no, I don't have anything else to add. I don't know if anybody has any questions they want to um, ask or Anthony I, has been looking at the chat and I don't know if he has anything that he wants, if there's anything in there that he wants to share. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> um, so far, there's just been one question regarding a non-credit round, um, which I've answered to that um, person in the chat. Okay. You know, right now we're just trying to um, get together our thoughts as far as what we're going to be doing with the scoring criteria. You know, time is of the essence right now because we will have to get everything, you know, presented in a final format to, the, you know, to everybody to you all as far as how we're going to be doing this. Um, so you all can be looking for projects. Um, we'll also have to make sure it gets to all of our, our board and gets to the governor in time for his signature and approval. So um, if you all have any comments, you know, or any suggestions, you know, we do welcome those and we would appreciate, you know, um, you providing those to us and I will have a, our, Comments can be sent to our multifamily inbox. Um, if you all have, if you have anything that you want to share with us, or if you have any comments that you want to um, bring up today. Well, and Terry, you may have seen that Adam has very politely raised his hand, and so maybe <laughs> we can hear from him. All right, go right ahead. Mute myself. Hi, hi, everyone. My name is Adam Haley. I'm with Goodwill Industries of Kentucky. Um, I have a probably very simple early question and then maybe a more detailed second follow-up if you'll allow me. Uh, the first question is, could you uh, detail very briefly the timeline for this comment period, when comments are due and when KHC plans on approving it? And then you mentioned that it goes to the governor for final approval. So just kind of a brief overview of the timeline. Thank you. Um, I would think we would like to have comments within the next couple of weeks. Um, we have to present all of our, um, you know, once we decide on which scoring criteria that we're going to be um, using, we'll want to get that out to you all in a final format. Um, and then we want to be able to take this to our board in February and then um, send it to the um, governor for approval. I believe that is in March, April-ish time frame. So, um, the, but again, the sooner we can get that information in, um, the quicker, the, I mean, the better it would be. And I would just encourage folks to not think about comment deadlines. Instead, so just send them now. You know what you think. You've got your perspectives. Just type them up today and hit send. I mean, there's really no reason to think, oh, I'll wait to the deadline and hit submit. No, we're, we are all thinking about these issues every day. And the sooner you get us your perspectives on them, the longer, more time we can spend thinking about them. And it looks like we have a few raised hands. Um, thank you all for being so polite with raising your hands. The first hand to go up was Shannon Tudor. So Shannon, if you'll unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, all right. Thanks, Anthony. I didn't even know, I didn't even know how to raise my hand a minute ago. <laughs> I had to uh, go figure that out. I just, Two comments, one sort of um, related to the census track scoring mechanism. And I, I honestly, I mean, I don't care if it's census tracks or, or by county. It, it, it's more of a thing of how do we educate the planning commissions and the, the uh, councils in those cities and, and counties of, of um, the scoring and how and why that we're there i mean i it, you would be surprised how many times we're in front of, or maybe you wouldn't how many times we're in front of planning commissions or city councils and they want to know why we're why are we in their particular area wanting to build affordable housing and then the answer said well you know because you need it the most of any place in the state and, and they're not even aware of that so i don't really know i, I don't have an answer for how that uh <clears throat> that ranking w would best be sent out to them. But I would think if, you know, the governor signs the QAP, I would think there's a way that could be distributed to all those local municipalities and their elected leaders to understand um, why we're, why we're in their communities. Um, second thing is on the disadvantaged business um, 
portion and and i would just you know and i'm happy to send an email in about it or talk about it more um as well but one of the things in the qap that hinders it hinders it for me is is the the portion that's in red that says for scoring purposes the disadvantaged business may not be a related party to the applicant developer or any of its principles well it's probably not a surprise to anybody that's in the developer business um that's doing affordable housing and preservation and and new construction of affordable housing but you you ain't gonna get rich doing this and it takes a it takes a long time to build up you know the capital or equity within a business to to jump into it new so like with me for instance i i specifically asked uh, you know travis yates and some of the folks within uh, socar and, and beacon that i've worked with for the last decade um, to join me in a, in a venture, um, you know, and create double legal developing, but then I can't do anything with SOCAR as, you know, and get the points for it, or, or SOCAR can't do anything with me and get the points because of that, uh, that relationship there. And I really think that could, at least in my case, it could be satisfied if, if it just was more of a deal that we, you know, that you just have to disclose those relationships and, uh, and, and be considered eligible for the points. I I don't know all the specific legalities to it, but I, w- I would certainly ask KHC just to take a look at that, you, you know, as a way to entice um, some new um, developers, some new companies that are that would qualify as a disadvantaged business to to sort of get into that. So um, I've taken enough of everybody's time, though. I appreciate it. And Shannon, as you mentioned, um, I encourage you to put those comments in writing and send them to us so we can consider it um, along with all the other comments. And it looks like we have a a second hand raised from Hannah Spillman at Winterwood. Hannah, you can unmute yourself. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is actually Mike Hines talking through (laughs) Hannah's laptop. Uh, So just to clarify uh, who's speaking here. Mark, thank you for uh, the time you spent with us, uh, spooling up uh, Q and A and conversation going leading into this meeting. And Terry Anthony, thank you for setting this up for us. We appreciate it. A uh, couple comments. I'll try to be brief, uh, but just just a couple comments. And, and all of this is in recognition that we are working with a limited resource environment here. But I would urge balance when we talk about um, allocations between renovation and new construction. Um, In a renovation project, often what we're saving, yes, we are saving the housing, the bricks and mortar, but we are also preserving in many cases, the rental assistance, which in rural communities and many parts of this state are vitally important. And if if we turn our backs from a policy perspective on those types of properties, uh, I think we will lose something that is at least not replicable in the near term at the federal level. We're not going to get new rental assistance easily in this state. We need to preserve what we have. Uh, A second comment relative to cost containment. I've always advocated for resource containment approach as opposed to a cost containment approach. So, you know, from, from KHC's practical perspective, if there is a limitation on resource per unit or resource that KHC is willing to give per development, but that development, for whatever reason, is able to attract other resources, uh, I, I, you know, from a from a certain policy perspective, I think that would accomplish the same goal in ensuring that KHC's resources are spread around, but also would facilitate potentially other financial partners coming into these transactions to assist. Certainly in some of our high cost areas in the state, we see that at the local level, and it'd be nice to see that generated more broadly. So just two comments. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. And again, I'll say this for not only you, but for everybody, Uh, we encourage you to memorialize your comments in writing and send them in to us as well as um, speaking them verbally to us. So thank you for that. Um, We have a hand raised from Tammy Stansbury at WOTA. Tammy, you can unmute. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, you know, we have sent comments in twice this year, I believe, you know, once through the coalition, and then I think Walter Cooper Companies has sent them in. Mark, do you want us to send the same comments since we've already sent comments about this or, you know, just send them again since we've yes. sent- Okay. 
that's 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 up to you really okay no i'm just saying we've sent the same ones in but yeah we'll continue we'll we'll send them in again thank you and it looks like adam haley has another question or or didn't lower his hand i'm not sure yes sir i do have another question um so uh mark you had mentioned reviewing about 100 different possibilities for point allocations in the QHP. Um, candidly, one that Goodwill is very interested in is uh, serving justice involved individuals. Um, we had not seen that in other spaces, and that is a population that we serve uh, quite primarily. Um, and is that a data point that you are familiar with, or is that something that is has been considered in other plans? So, what I presume what your some type of criminal record, criminal history. Is yes, that, that'd be that'd be correct. Someone, someone justice involved, anyone with a uh, criminal background that has um, perhaps had problems getting being rented to into the past. In the past, um, we see a lot of that population and focus very heavily on that. Right. So. My main thought on that is that it's less about QAPs because those are prospective documents. Those really only relate to um, the you know, things that get awarded going forward. And so I'm going to put here in the chat um, a link to um, what is generally applicable guidance that applies not just all of the existing tax credit, not just all existing HUD, but all housing that the uh, Obama administration, their Department of Housing and Development Office of General Counsel wrote a memo in 2016 about how all rental property owners, again, market rate, everyone, the whole country, has to implement um, criminal screening and in my personal opinion, it covers pretty much what, from an advocacy perspective, I'm sure there could be more, but to the extent that owners follow what HUD says is the way fair housing works, it, again, and that's a, that's a big question. Are folks really following what it says? If they do, then truly comply with it, spirit and practice, the justice of all folks should get at least a reasonably fair shake at getting access to the housing. And so that, to me, is the best way to come at and address the how these properties serve that population is, again, just by implementing as HUD interprets it, um, the existing law. Because if we put something in the QAP, that's only going to apply to projects that uh, that get funded. However, it's got nothing to do with the projects. Because I mentioned it, that will link to the 114 uh, QAP. We both mentioned it now again. With the caveat that a lot of them don't make any sense. They're just there. So it's not endorsement. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, looking at the chat, there is a question from um, Kitty McCune uh, to you, Terry, um, asking um, if you could give some insight on when KHC thinks the next tax exempt bond round will be. Um, well, hopefully we will have one next year. I think it will just depend on, um, you know, we have our Western Kentucky NOFA open at the moment. So depending on the amount of bond volume that we have, um, you know, it would be nice if we, if I can tell you exactly when, but unfortunately I don't know for sure when that will be next year. I can't, and Terry hasn't even been informed of this. I can let you all know that we received uh, more bond cap than our regular allocation. Yeah. So, so stay tuned. We are hopeful. We just learned that today. So that's why I hadn't even had a chance to tell Terry. Anything. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. That's yeah. good news. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And there is a question in the chat from Stephanie Sweeney asking if the proposed QAP 
includes continuation of the innovation pool? Um, you know, we, we hope to include the innovation pool. I don't know um, that I'm not considering it. So um, again, you know, these are all things that we will have to consider internally. Um, for those who don't know the process, we will be having a formal public hearing on the QAP probably early next year, likely in, you know, uh, February. It does have to be done, you know, so many days prior to our board meeting. Um, I think it's usually about 10 to 14 days prior to the board meeting. So um, if you're not signed up for our eGrams, which for all of you who are on here, I think you are. Um, so just make sure that you are uh, looking for that so that we will have that um, public hearing coming up in February. So. Well, Terry, if I can summarize what I what I think you just said is there's no guarantee that the innovation pool will continue, but we don't have a, a defined um, aversion to continuing it. I think it's just going to be dependent on how we're able to slice up the the pie of um, available LITEX um, to address our priority uh, for creating um, a lot more new units. Yes, that is correct. Um, and Tiffany's asked if you can put the PowerPoint back that shows the quick wins. So probably like the first or first couple of pages. I will try. I've been technically challenged today. There we go. Is Maybe that where you were heading, Tiffany? You can unmute yourself if you've got direct questions. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to put this list back up, what you guys are looking at for quick wins. And I think it was this page and maybe um, the next page. Um, and just encourage anyone on the call um, that if you have any feedback or suggestions on these, um, you know, go ahead and, and, you know, either bring it up today or, you know, please submit comments to Terry, um, because I think this is a really great opportunity for us to get some some quick changes done that's going to be really beneficial for everyone submitting applications so i think it was this page and then the next page um no it had to do with maybe it was before this it had to do with um oh, here it there is. You go. It is. yeah um because i know that many of these topics that are on here are topics that we've had discussions at at our board meetings um and a lot of you have some really good suggestions and comments so again if if you don't feel comfortable bringing it up here or, or you know, you just want to think about it and write out some responses. I really encourage you all um, to submit your comments and some suggestions or guidance on this, because I think these are things that can be addressed quickly and have a really big benefit um, for all of us submitting applications. So I just want to thank uh, Terry and Anthony for um, working with us on trying to make some of these changes quickly for the next round. Absolutely. Thank you, Tiffany. You know, I know you've all done a lot of work on, you know, working with Mark since he came on. Um, but again, like Tiffany said, if you don't feel comfortable talking about him here in this platform, please reach out to me, send them to me in an email. Um, you can send them directly to me or to our multifamily inbox. If you have any comments, I mean, any suggestions, solutions, I'd be happy to look at those and to see what you all have to say because you all are the ones boots on the ground that are doing the work, you know, to get these new units up and all of that work is very much appreciated. And I'm just trying to um, find a middle common ground for all of us that we can um, make sure that we're doing, you know, the great work that you all are doing. Thanks, Terry. And it looks like Tammy Stansbury has her hand raised again, or maybe that's just her other hand. <laughs> I just I just want to add to Tiffany's comments. Um, anybody on this call that is a part of the Kentucky Affordable Housing Coalition, you know, if you'd feel more comfortable in sending your comments to Tiffany, because I know the coalition is also going to put together uh, a list of things to shoot to KHC, and you may feel more comfortable just submitting them to the coalition. So I just want to put that out there. If so, send them to Tiffany, and then I think we've got a group of people that's going to tally all this together and get a, a big long list of KHC, or maybe not a long list, but get a list of KHC. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. 
Any other questions? There was a question um, in the chat, Terry, um, from Kevin Brown, um, asking about, are there any plans to incorporate a state tax credit? And mm. my response to him is that at this point, Kentucky does not have a state long-term housing tax credit other than the credits available for historic preservation. So um, as much as we would love to have that resource, we don't currently have that available to us um, in Kentucky. And then we had a, a comment from uh, Johan, who um, has indicated that he will also send this to us in writing. And, and Johan, I don't know if you want to take yourself off mute and and discuss your comment, or if you just want me to, to read it for you um, regarding our disadvantaged business um, scoring criteria. Sure. I, I'll just summarize it quickly. I was recommending that we revert to past QAPs, where the disadvantaged business um, criteria was more organically incorporated into each deal is basically like a baseline requirement of how many disadvantaged businesses we had to have involved as either vendors, subcontractors, consultants in each deal, which was more, you know, ended up being a, a mandatory requirement to do so other than what we did the last, I mean, sorry, rather than what we did the last two years, which was to kind of force some artificial partnerships with um, disadvantaged groups to chase points, which were very important in getting to the score you needed to get to get funded. So I was just stating a preference for how it used to be, um, given the fact that the, the IRS Section 42 is basically silent on this issue. So we have the ability to kind of um, create our own preferences that meet um, more realistic and meaningful targets other than just kind of gerrymandering for points. And if I can, I would like to speak to that just briefly, Johan. And first of all, thank you for your comments. Um, and you're right, there is no um, Section 42 requirement regarding um, disadvantaged businesses. But it is a KHC priority and something we're really focusing on as a corporation to um, kind of broaden our, our, um, our base of, of who we do business with, um, who we serve, to make sure that you know everybody has an opportunity so i think what we were trying to accomplish that we didn't necessarily achieve in the last few years was creating avenues for disadvantaged development entities to gain access to um, the tax credits and other resources um, in partnership with you know established experienced development entities um, rather than creating as you termed it like artificial relationships and you know, forced creation of, of entities is really to, to seek out and identify existing development entities who really needed a kind of a hand up into the process. So that's my take on it. Um, as Mark mentioned, it's it's all up for discussion, um, but just know that it is a, a, a KHC priority that's high on our radar right now. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'll, uh, you know, I'll speak to that as well. I, I think it's a, a good priority, but our QAP and the capacity um, I guess the capacity permission slip basically doesn't limit participation by a developer. So you know, it, it, it's basic, you know, we're scoring basically um, this to give a preference to, to groups that, um, you know, there's no barrier. It's just a, uh, I think it's an unnecessary advantage. All right, any other questions or comments? Terry, I'd like to make a comment. It's not, it doesn't pertain just to the QAP, but um, in will not be used for uh, crafting our scoring. I wanna make sure that's clear, but KHC um, will soon have under contract Bowen National Research um, with the aim of Bowen um, establishing a housing supply gap analysis for every county. Uh, a baseline for our current gap of housing units um, by AMI and by housing type, so rental, home ownership, and different income levels. Uh, so a baseline and then also a five-year projection. We hope to get the baseline in February, the five-year projection, which will require a little more research about job creation, migration, and that kind of stuff, housing starts. The projection for five years would be sometime in the summer. And, and I bring that up only because we are trying to, we know there's a housing supply gap. 
I feel pretty sure it's just about every dang place in Kentucky, but we'd like to understand where it really is, where are the hot spots and where are the projected hot spots, um, so that we're not that we're attaching scoring to it. I want to make that clear, but so that we are a helping local areas think about it, get on top of it, elevate it at the state level, and um, really try to highlight the missing middle housing that we don't have, um, but also give you all, someone early on in this webinar mentioned, you know, uh, localities asking, why are you trying to build low-income units in our area? Well, it might give you a tool for making the case about the need. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. You'll you'll see it in e-grams and webinars and all that kind of stuff from us next year. Thank you. And my kinds, it looks like you had, or or Hannah, whoever you are, it looks like you maybe you had your hand raised temporarily. Did you have a question? W Wendy answered my question before I asked it. Thank oh, you. Okay, <laughs> good deal. Great. Just want to make sure we didn't miss you. All right. Um, there's no other questions. Again, I encourage you to submit your comments, questions to either myself or our multifamily inbox. Um, you know, the sooner the better or those with the coalition, submit those to Tiffany um, so we can um, be putting together, you know, your list and we will be reaching out and letting you know of our next um, developer form when we have our scoring criteria kind of um, finalized and um, we all guess we will be in touch. Thank you all. Thank you, and, and thank you to Mark for facilitating this uh, meeting.